Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, and this is View from the North, where we look north to see what's going on in Canada and how it compares with what's going on in the U.S. And the question before the House is, what do Canadians think of Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister? And for this discussion, I'm going to talk to a Canadian, our, our favorite Canadian, Ken Rogers, Dr. Ken Rogers, retired Canadian businessman in Kelowna, British Columbia. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hello, Jay. It's very so let's nice talk about spring. it. It's nice spring in Canada, despite our stink as a prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a feeling this is going to be a very candid discussion here. So and tell us about, uh, you know, you, you've lived in Canada pretty much all your life. You've seen a lot of prime ministers come and go. You've seen, you know, of course, the media will write up uh, everything that a prime minister does. Um, so how, how, how is uh, Justin Trudeau doing? Well, he is the prime minister of Canada because in the last election he got a third of the vote. Now, that um, would surprise most Americans. How could you be prime minister if you only got a third of the popular vote? And in fact, the Conservative Party got about 1% more vote than he did, or than his party did. You know, the, 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 um, in Canada, you do not vote for the prime minister separately. Like in the U.S., you have a presidential vote having you know, very separate from voting for your congressional stuff in the parliamentary system that they have in Britain, Australia, Canada, et cetera. You know, you vote the party with the greatest number of seats, you know, gets to lead or become prime minister. Their head becomes the prime minister. Well, in Canada, we have a coalition um, government, much like since Israel's in the news lots, everybody knows there's a, you know, several parties together to keep Netanyahu in power. And in Canada, we have three fairly significant parties, um, you know, two major, let's call it liberal and conservative, and the, and the third party is um, left of the liberal party sort of in Bernie Sanders territory. Well, that third party has combined with the Liberal Party or Trudeau's party to become the government. Um, and uh, and they've done nothing. I knew this was going to be a candid discussion. Well, uh, about the only legislation that anybody could remember, I spoke to a few people and asked them, what has Trudeau accomplished in, you know, almost eight years of being the prime minister? And the only one they could think of was that he legalized marijuana. So um, that that's not much when you think of all the issues in the world, which include all the issues in Canada. So question, um, do, how do people feel about that? If he was running on a popular vote, not that he has to, but if he was running on a popular vote today, how would he do? Is he a popular leader? Uh, yes and no. Um, there is a certain segment of the population that, you know, absolutely thinks he's wonderful. But the majority do not think he's wonderful. So really it's this, whether the two parties that now operate as a coalition will get enough votes or not. If there were an election in the very near future, it's probably likely they would get voted out, booted out. Um, you know, the Conservative Party in Canada, which is a lot more moderate than the U.S. Republican Party, especially right now, um, <clears throat> you know, they have increased in popularity in the polls to a great extent because Trudeau has done nothing. You know, he's his method of government is is he does very, very well standing before a microphone, making speeches, you know, and he makes wonderful promises and he just looks so sincere. And I'll use an example of you know, that he makes the promise and that's the end of it. You know, you never get a broadcast that 
shows what did he ever follow up on. You know, he just does not follow up on anything. Uh, but a great example is, is we had an atmospheric river about three years ago in British Columbia that, uh, that you know, caused havoc in the mountain passes. It just wiped out every highway that could get from Vancouver into anywhere. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you just couldn't get from the coast inland from British Columbia. This, all the mountain passes, you know, they just obliterated them with this atmospheric river. Well, one uh, town that was kind of a crossroads of a couple of highways called Merritt, a little wee place, but it got absolutely decimated, decimated, and he was right on the news really quick. Our minds and hearts are with you, and oh, woe is us and poor people, and we will get right in there. The federal government's behind you. Well, about three years later, there's absolutely zero been done. You know, just zero. And that's what he promises all the time. You know, he'd make a little speech with, before NATO, you know, saying, you know, Canada will, you know, you know, meet its commitments. You know, well, I think Canada's, you know, percentage of gross domestic product spent on defense is the lowest of the G7. It's certainly the lowest of any of the sizable countries that, that make up or the uh, NATO, the smallest in NATO. Um, but he just makes these terrific promises. Uh, you know, one of the major platforms that he said was he was going to make, uh, you know, um, reconciliation with the um, with the indigenous population in Canada. You know, well, the United Nations ranks Canada as close to the worst in the world in the treatment of its native people. Um, you know, they they put them all out on on reservations, much like you know, the Americans did, you know, but, you know, in Canada, we didn't ship people from Georgia to Oklahoma or somewhere and set the reservation on what was then thought of as close to the worst land in the United States. You know, our reservations were set up where the natives were, you know, they were just shrunk in, in size so that the actual reservations are pretty tiny. Well, in Canada, about, you know, half the native population lives in what I call remote areas. And those reservations, you know, have an absolute dearth of, of or complete absence of, you know, fresh water, you know, like the, any of the necessities, you know, and these endless promises will do all these things. And, and it does nothing. Well, do, uh, do people understand this? Do they know this? Does the media report on this? Um, how does he get away with it? Um, well, how does Donald Trump get away with, you know, endless numbers of lies and still have people, you know, an anti-democratic stuff and still get away with it? You know, is, is the public's not overly well informed, like, like they used to be. Everybody used to get a a local newspaper, and you you know had a, you know good uh, journalism in those days. The newspapers were pretty straightforward. Like you know, I think of the Washington Post and L.A. Times that are you know pretty good newspapers. New York Times. Um, we don't have much of that anymore that anybody gets. Hmm. So uh, he's he's very good looking. Um, we have a picture of him, and uh, what's remarkable is that he looks like a teenager, but he's actually fifty two years old, born in nineteen seventy one. Um, and it's, it you know it's and uh, and as I say, really fabulous picture of him all over the place uh, from from the cover of Teen Vogue, and I I can see all the um, you know the young teenager people. Uh, jumping up and down about him. What, 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 what is, what is, it, how does his looks factor into this? His youthful looks, his forever youthful looks. Well, was Bill Clinton's <clears throat> looks a factor in his being elected? Your answer is yes. 
you know, and, and it has been a role. I mean, he wrote in to a great extent on his father's name and his father's accomplishments. Like his father was absolutely brilliant, did some fantastic legislation, was an abrasive personality to many people. You either really liked him or really hated him. I was in the latter category. <laughs> um, and so when just when the name popped up, I already had a negative uh, <laughs> response. But uh, the the two of them don't resemble each other at all. Like if you put photographs of them and doesn't matter how you magnify it, you could never believe that that Justin Trudeau is Pierre Trudeau's son. They have no nothing in looks compared to them. And in terms of of brilliance, uh, you know, Pierre Trudeau was was a very brilliant individual um, and accomplished things the U.S. has yet to accomplish. For example, Canada's elections really work well because of Pierre Trudeau. He's the one that that brought in the legislation that took big money out of elections, shortened the election cycle so big money didn't matter. And and he, you know, repat, you know, Canada was a, let's call it, wasn't a, a colony of Britain, but it was in, you know, the, it was the Dominion of Canada and it still had a bunch closer ties to Britain. And he, you know, repatriated the Constitution created a Bill of Rights, you know, and his son Justin has done diddly squat in eight years in in power. So you're saying that uh, Justin Justin had the benefit of the Trudeau name, Absolutely. and that in his looks, you know, got him into office. Well, why would some Americans be willing to vote for um, RFK Jr.? You know, and it, and it, there's a Kennedy name, and it it has great meaning with, and there's good reason. You know, John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy were pretty neat politicians, accomplished a lot of great things, and and so somebody would think, well, if it's another one of the Kennedys, I'm in favor. You know, but uh, that in that name recognition for Trudeau still carries a lot of weight. Um, but um, there's no way that his his smarts, um, he's not a dumb person. You know, he's very, like Justin, is very well educated, or let's just say, I wouldn't use the well, as he has tons and tons of education. Uh, if you said, what did he do from when he finished high school? Well, the next 15 years, he just went in and out of different colleges. You know, he really did nothing. Like he was 23 before he had a Bachelor of Arts degree. And that's when they gave arts degrees only took three years. That he majored in literature. Well, then, you know, he fluffed around for a little while. Then he went to University of British Columbia because uh, they have better skiing in BC. <laughs> and uh, and he, you know, it took a you know a bachelor of education degree. Well, you know, then you know he fluffed around a little bit. You know, taught part time, um, you know, a junior high school level. You know, like grade seven, eight, nine era. Well, then he, you know, decided. Well, he'll go and back to Montreal and take um, some more college. And so he took engineering at, at a great college in Montreal, took a couple years of, of that or a year and a half and then packed that in, then fluffed around a little while more and then went back to the college in British Columbia and took environmental geology. I had to hesitate because the names don't, tend to fit together. No. no. <laughs> and, and then he packed up that education. Well, now, by then, he was about 33. Well, then he stopped doing that because when his father died, um, he 
gave a eulogy, which was heard by everybody in Canada. And it was absolutely fantastic. Just mind dropper saying, wow, here's this guy named Trudeau. What a neat name, you know, for a politician. And, and listen to him speak and look at how handsome he is and wow. And so he then started to get, you know, requests for this and that. Well, you know, people look, gee, he's in his early 30s, you know, or 30, almost 35 by then, having done diddly squat other than having taught some junior high school courses in British Columbia. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and you'd say, well, what courses? If you listen to the news, they would say, well, how could a drama teacher ever be prime minister? Like, that's the quote you hear the most for anybody that doesn't like him, that he was a drama teacher, you know, like showing acting, and that's all he does as prime minister, you know, a phony actor. Uh -huh. um, where really, he taught everything from soup to nuts, but of course, if you look at what he took in college, you know, he taught, actually taught junior high school math. And he did teach drama, <laughs> you know, but, you know, he taught literature. Well, his Bachelor of Arts degree was in literature. He taught several things. So he's highly educated, you know, but I don't know that, but he's got terrible, terrible judgment compared to his father. Give me an example of that. Well, there was a, he's been in several scandals, you know, all because, you know, if you're a critic, you'd say because of his stupidity, you know, well, he is not stupid. He just has bad judgment or, you know, and, um, you know, he was born with a silver spoon. You bet. And so, you know, you, you have no idea of whether he's been, you know, on the gravy train, you know, like the senator from New Jersey in the United States um, or not, you know, nothing direct that anybody's made, but he's been in a bunch of scandals that stunk. Well, one of the reasons that I think his, his judgment is poor and when people are up close to him, he's not as likable as, as he is on TV. Um, that he's had trouble getting um, other people that are high, high talent around him. You know, if you took his, his current cabinet where he's made a big fuss about, well, we want to have equal rights, and so we should have 50% of the, of the Canadian cabinet should be women. You know, well... You get it when you only get about a quarter of the people elected are women, and then you're going to pick from those. You have trouble. Oh, one thing Americans may not know is is in Canada, the the head of the cabinet, the head of each department, is the person that a person who was voted in. That is, you don't hire, you know, like you do not uh, have either a, whether the person's a politician or a non-politician, but in the U.S., the president picks the cabinet, and the cabinet, each of the cabinet has a department, but in that department, there are senior people that tend to stay there, or, you know, reasonably senior. Sometimes they turn, them, turn over those people to have ones that are more favorable, but while in Canada, you know, the head of every department is somebody that's been voted in. Well, it's no wonder they've done nothing when they've got, you know, third class people having been voted in and chosen to be head of some department. Uh, well, when they had this this uh, scandal, called, it was a um, large construction company thing in Montreal. Um, and um, Montreal has an image in Canada like New Jersey. You know, if there's anything been is dishonest in Canada, you'd say, "Oh, where did where in Montreal did it happen?" <laughs> you know? But anyhow, uh, that'd be the first question. It's not always the case. But it's certainly the image. 
um, justified so. But um, this scandal, he had um, two of the cabinet ministers, you know, said what Trudeau had given as speeches as the excuse for how this happened. They just said, that's bloody well not right. You know, some good, honest, straightforward Canadian politician, both were women. Um, and, uh, you know, so, of course, he devise a way to get them kicked out of the party and out of the parliament. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, so the really good people have not wanted to get, you know, branded next to them. You know, sort of in the current cabinet, you know, two of the women, the, the um, foreign affairs minister or what the Americans would call secretary of state, you know, the gorgeous blonde, you know, she, she's about five, eight or nine in height. So she's taller than a lot of these international pre, er, presidents. Um, you know, if you see a NATO picture or something, the good looking blonde is, she's a, a smart one. And, and you know, the, the one that um, Trump really, really didn't like uh, named Freeland. And those two are about the only two um, cabinet ministers that have been able, that stuck around, that had any brains at all. You know, and but so you said before, you said before that uh, he's been in office eight years. And you said before that uh, his uh, election is done by by the parliament. Um, and uh, and I, I suppose the parliament could vote him out any time. Um, there could be elections. Not, not the parliament, the members of his party that are in parliament. Got it. So, uh, and and you mentioned also that the uh, coalition um, that he has cobbled together are the left and the further left. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Is, <laughs> um, but that there is a conservative, you know, group, uh, you know, maybe growing the way it's growing in the U.S., um, that, you know, that uh, doesn't agree with the liberals. So I guess my question is, if he is so do-nothing, why is he still there? Uh, why are the liberals so, still so popular that they feel they have to leave him there? Uh, why don't they kick him out in favor of somebody who would, um, you know, provide a, 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 a better uh, political return for them? Um, eight years is a long time. It's longer than a president. Well, um, Canada's political balance is very different than, than the United States. Um, you know, in the U.S., um, in the most biased of states, the losing party still gets a pretty good share of the vote. You know, if you took you know, North Dakota, the Democrats don't do too badly, or in Texas, they don't do too badly. They lose, but they don't do too badly. In Canada, you've got you know, a province like Saskatchewan or Alberta, and most of the time, the liberals get zero. <laughs> like they, they get just absolutely wiped. Um, whereas, um, the you know population in Canada is so heavily concentrated in uh, you know the let's call it the St Lawrence River you know go from Montreal to Detroit almost you know or a little bit north of Montreal to Detroit you got you got more than half of Canada in that little area uh, you know like Toronto has more people than um, every province except Quebec. You know, like Toronto, has, British Columbia is the third most populous province, and it has less people than the metropolitan Toronto. So you're saying that Eastern Canada keeps him in office. The, the Eastern Canada, Canada, which is largely French, is liberal, and it keeps him in office. Is that what you're well, saying? Well, the, the Quebec doesn't really like to vote for conservatives. Um, now, 
Ontario is interesting. They like to vote for a they rural or let's call it non Toronto parts of Ontario vote for the Conservatives in Toronto for the Liberals when it's federal. The minute it's a provincial election, they'll vote for the Conservatives. They like to have a different a provincial premier that's not of the same party. As well, the that federal. sounds like a good idea, don't you think? <laughs> well, uh, it, but anyhow, you you um, <clears throat> uh, the when you can run, be prime minister with only a third of the popular vote, you know, you really have you know reason for some dismay among many people. <laughs> Well, you know, I asked you whether his good looks played into it. Certainly, yes. his father's name plays into it. But, uh, you know, there's another element that I would like to explore, and that is the French thing. I don't think people in the U.S. understand, you know, how the French are concentrated uh, in Montreal, Quebec, and Eastern Canada in general. Um, and here's a, his, his father was French. He's French. His wife, Sophie, was French. I, they're divorced now, I guess. Um, but uh, I wonder how French that group in the legislature is. Is it all French? Uh, how powerful are the French? How powerful is the French language? You know, and the U.S. does not understand that. Most people do not understand this bifurcation in Canada. And here's a, a political bifurcation that is playing out in the form of this, you know, uh, French the second French um, prime minister in, in only a, a few years. Am I uh, how French? <laughs> well, I just, I don't understand. Oh. It's just maybe there are more people voting in French Canada? No. Um, like I might surprise you to say, what whatever you said, Americans don't understand. You know, mm -hmm. neither do most people in Western Canada. <laughs> okay, <laughs> is, is, um now, actually, Canada has has more than three parties in its federal parliament. If there's, you know, there's always some pop up party showing up. Well, there is a, you know, a special Quebec party, you know, that favored you know, that Quebec should become a separate standalone country of its own. You know, and that has always been a factor that's been sitting around since the days in particular of Charles de Gaulle, if you remember the French mm -hmm. guy from World War II. Mm -hmm. You know, he, you know, came to Canada to visit and there's a nice political gesture. He leaves by saying, Viva la Quebec Libre. <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as if France, the country's in favor of Quebec separating from Canada. Now, that's always been a factor, and so you have, um, you know, separatist -y causes. Well, you know, when I grew up in Alberta, uh, which is the province that's second closest to the Pacific Ocean in Canada, kind of like Nevada or Idaho, distance from the Pacific Ocean, you know, and I really, really just born in, in that area, you just inherit the thinking of you know the the province or the area and and i can remember just begrudging having to learn to speak french at, you know at school but it really because it was still such red deck country they didn't even put the french into school until you reached either grade nine or ten um but and i they were supposed to this is a bilingual country. Well, right? You have two official languages. And they in, Redneck, in, yeah. in Redneck, Alberta, <laughs> they had stick it in your ear, you know. <laughs> um, and, and there was such an animosity among my friends and so on. And, and at the time, you know, they had the oil discovered in Alberta. And, you know, example, a high school I went to was probably 40. 40, 50 percent uh, kids that were the sons of Americans that had moved to Canada to, to uh, work in the oil and gas industry. Well, you know, I kept saying, 
look, I don't want to speak French. I live closer to Mexico. I'm far more likely to go to visit Mexico as I grow older and go on holidays. I'm never going to go to Quebec. And, and why would I ever want to go there? There's nothing there that would interest me. They can't even, I can't even talk to them, <laughs> you, know, you know, but, um, and, and, <laughs> You know, that... well, let me let me add that the, there are a lot of people in Quebec who don't speak English. Am well, I right? Yes. Well, when you use Quebec and Montreal simultaneously, shows a little bit of an American misunderstanding. You know, Montreal used to be, you know, the the New York of Canada, like it was the be all and center of the earth. I mean, everything evolved. It was the financial capital. It was the headquarters of all the major industries. And, and it was about 50% English speaking and 50% French speaking. And if you went 10 inches outside Montreal, nobody spoke English. Wow. That, that is almost the case now. The difference is that that Ottawa is technically in Ontario. Well, it's really on the border between um, Ontario and Quebec. Ottawa on the, on the, well, as Ottawa has grown to, to about 1.6 million people, you know, there's probably 150, 200,000 of it, at least on the Quebec side of the Ottawa River. You know, so metropolitan Ottawa now has lots of English speaking people, but, uh, you know, the um, <clears throat> uh, Quebec, it's really all in um, in Montreal, the people that speak English, you know, for, for and example. Everybody else, everybody else speaks French and not English. Oh, oh yeah. Gorgeous city, you know, Quebec City, um, further up the, you know, or let's call it further north from Montreal is almost a million people in size and and you could go there and and have real trouble finding anybody that could talk to you in English. So they must love Trudeau. I I would I would guess that Trudeau and the people around him speak French. Well, uh, they Tr must love Trudeau. Tru Trudeau is bilingual like anybody would say how could you dream of Perfect bilingualism. I mean, he is silky smooth in both languages. You know, he's a he's a fairly good public speaker. When he gets angry, he's a really good public speaker. <laughs> he's been in debating classes. Um, you know, he's 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 capable athletically. Uh, you know, example. Um, you know, his father wanted the he had three sons, even though he was over 50 when, let's call it Pierre Trudeau, Justin's father, was over 50 when, when Justin was born. And Pierre Trudeau divorced his wife when Justin was about six years old. Now, he'd always lived with lots of money and, and nannies and that sort of thing. But, you know, for example, before he was 20, uh, his younger brother, both he and w of which were born on Christmas Day. If you can believe that. Wow, how, <laughs> like, do, you, how like, do you organize that? You have to have Just, a lot of Justin, to do that. Pierre Trudeau was very smart. He figured out how to do it. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> the, uh, but his younger brother, you know, they, they were skiing in what is called the Bugaboos in British Columbia. It's a, an area in the Kootenays um, area of, of north of Idaho, straight north of Idaho, but in the most wild country. Well, any 20-year-old that can ski in the Bugaboos has had an awful lot of skiing and has got to be very athletic. I mean, it is heaven. In, in for skiing for anybody well the, the trudeau kids and the father could you know ski like whizzes i mean that's why the son moved to british columbia when he well he was mm. fluffing along with uh you know 
15 years to go through college. I suppose if I asked you, is this unique in your lifetime, the phenomenon of, of uh, Justin Trudeau? Uh, he's not like any other prime minister, I think, in your lifetime. And so That's where, where, sure. is it, <laughs> <laughs> where is it taking Canada? What can Canada expect, either from a continuation of Justin Trudeau or the next prime minister, however, you know, from whatever power base he is selected? Um, you know, I mean, I'm always interested in sea changes. What sea changes does Justin Trudeau represent? Well, a little bit like the United States, you know, you, you elect a president and usually, it's really rare for that president not to win a second term if they're running. You know, and the same idea in Canada. Uh, you know, now Trudeau is, you know, two-thirds of the way through his second term or getting close to the end of his second term. Uh, and the popularity tends to go down. And like in the U.S., well, if we had party A for eight years, now it's time to change. That tends to be, you know, an action um, where um, the Canadian Parliament has certainly not been historically as adversarial as the U.S. Congress is now. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, we've got, we've seemed to inherit, you know, a stronger conservative movement than lately, uh, but it's not as ugly as the American one. Pardon my bias, but that's... No, I'm, I'm in the same place. But, you know, what does this mean? As we go down the track here, the conservatives are going to get more powerful. I mean, I think there's a trend, certainly in this country and in Europe, you know, toward conservatism and maybe even autocracy. So the, the question is, uh, where does Trudeau stand on all of that? Will he last more? Um, I, I guess he could. There's no term limit on him. Uh, or will there be a conservative prime minister next time around? Have anybody Has anybody surfaced who might actually oppose him uh, or be the next prime minister? Or is, does he... Ha does he have the feel right now? Um, there's a lot of conjecture that the the current head of the Conservative Party in Canada, a guy named, you know, also who's very, very fluent in French, nice French name, Polyev, you know, um, that, uh, <clears throat> but he was uh, sort of born and raised in politics, and that's it. You know, I think he was a member of parliament when he was about 30 years old, and he's now about 45 or 50 and, you know, has never had another job. You know, Is he better qualified than Trudeau? In my opinion, yes. But um, in Canada, you tend to have a substantial element of the people that are fairly conservative and will vote for the conservative party. Um, and then you have everybody else is, I'll vote for anybody but a conservative. <laughs> well, when you have this group of parties, such as in Quebec, let's say they don't like Trudeau, well, they will vote for the Quebec separatist party before they will vote for conservative. So, wow. that, so that that, or they'll vote for the third party, the one let's call NDP, which is sort of Bernie Sanders level of way over on the left. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they're always as far over, but about the same. Um, so they, none of those fringe parties will make a coalition with the conservatives so the, well, the conservatives have to win 51 percent to become oh, to have, have for a the prime minister now that does happen fairly often and and especially if the head of the conservative party is from quebec you know there was you know a a month or so ago a former prime minister died guy named Brian Mulroney, 
Now he was from Montreal, and he was um, one a one of the last prime ministers that got along with every U.S. president that he dealt with. <laughs> you know, um, very Irish guy <laughs> in his nature, but he was actually from rural Quebec and very fluent in both French and English, and and he swept Canada like he got. You know, three quarters of the seats in the in the parliament just as a conservative. But well, that's not. one of the threads of our discussion, Ken. I, you know, Canada is different uh, in many ways, the same but different. And if Americans want to be, you know, fully informed, they they really have to know what you're talking about. And not only that, but they have to follow it because it's not static; it changes. Um, and so I, I'm afraid to say that a lot of Americans don't follow. But we follow it here on Think Tech, and I, I sure appreciate you sharing all this. Um, I'm looking forward to further discussions with you, Ken. Ken Rogers, retired Canadian businessman, helping us understand what's on the other side of the border, you know, view from the north, as you will. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha from Canada. want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.